Man, so excited you're here. Can we just welcome our online family? Thank you guys for joining us today. If you live in the area, I wanna encourage you to get in the house. If you're not, welcome from wherever you're watching from, share the stream. Man, what a powerful time of worship. I don't know about y'all, I did not come to go through the motions today. Come on, we came to encounter the living God, amen? I believe that God wants to, I do, I believe God wants to change your world. And over the next four weeks, that's what we're gonna talk about. Today we're kicking off a new series. And I believe God wants to do something great, not only in you, but through you. And so let's go to the scriptures now, Matthew chapter nine. If you have a Bible, you can grab it, turn there. If you don't, you can look on the Sky Bible behind me. Y'all like that, the Sky Bible, y'all like that? So Matthew chapter nine, we're gonna start in verse 35. If you're ready for the word of God, shout, I'm ready. If you need a second, say, hold up. No hold ups, Matthew nine, verse 35. Jesus went into all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news. Somebody say good news. The good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I wanna read Mark chapter one. Jesus went into Galilee preaching the good news, say good news, the good news of God. He said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near to repent and believe the good news. The heart, you can clap for that, that's a good word. The harvest is plentiful. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. What are we waiting on? To hell with hesitation. That's what I wanna preach about today. Turn to your neighbor, say to hell with hesitation. To hell with hesitation. I'm making some of you nervous already. Like where did I? I came to punch the devil in the face today. To hell with hesitation. We got a job to do. So let's pray and believe God for it. If you will, stretch a hand towards heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for what you're doing, not just here, but around the earth. God, today I pray for those who don't know you, but I also pray for those who do, who are followers of you. I pray you would awaken the church. You would awaken them to the calling you've placed on their life, that you would awaken them to the purpose that you've given them. God, that you would just do something beyond what we can ask, think, or imagine. Would you do a great work in this place today? Would you do a great work through these people as they leave this afternoon? But God, for a couple moments as we open your word, I pray that every single word would come from your mouth. Get me out of the way, stand in my body, speak to my mouth, the things you would have us know, say, and do. We love you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody who believed this said. Amen. Come on, everybody said. Amen. Look at somebody, tell them to hell with hesitation. <laughs> to hell with hesitation. Oof. If I haven't met you, my name is uh, Cody Woodard. I get the honor and privilege of serving as pastor here. Uh, my wife is about to have our third son in just four days. Come on, somebody. If you didn't know, we have two boys born on the same day, July 13th, two years apart. And uh, I know, crazy, right? And then this week, my wife went to the doctor. They told her she's ready to have this baby. They're not gonna let her go 40 weeks. And so they set her induction date to July 13th. <laughs> which means we're gonna have three boys born on the same day within a five year span. Come on, isn't that crazy? Somebody needs to, you know, I don't know, call the hospital, tell them to pay for our medical bills or something. Like that's gotta be a record. Well, uh, a couple months ago, I had an opportunity to officiate a wedding of a couple in our church and man, beautiful wedding, about an hour drive away and beautiful scenery. Everybody was looking good. How many of you just love a good wedding? Any, any wedding goers, any wedding crashers in the house? Come on, somebody. Uh, and so I officiated the wedding and it was, um, it, was, it was incredible. And after we got done, we're kind of waiting on the bridal party to take their pictures and the reception is starting. There might've been a cocktail hour happening at that time. Of course I didn't participate, okay? Uh, and so I'm standing there and this, this older man, I think it may have been a grandpa of the groom or the bride comes up to me and he said, pastor, that was a good word. It's nice to meet you. And he starts shaking my hand. And uh, he's like, hey, I got, a, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He said, are you scared of me? I'm like, I'm not scared of you. No, bro, I could take you. You know what I'm saying? 
and he's just shaking my hand. He said, if you ain't scared of me, then why are you shaking so much? I was like, come on, old man, that's a good joke right there. And he said, no, I got a, I got a real question for you I wanna ask, and I think your ministry will depend on your answer. Said, okay. He said, um, what's something from earth that you can take to heaven? I said, it's a good question. He said, it is a good question. You better think about it. I said, well, it isn't money. It's not stuff. It's not clothes. It's not my drip. It's not my J's. Come on, somebody. <laughs> not my jewelry, not my car, not my house. What's something you can take from earth with you to heaven? I thought, oh, my soul. I said, my soul. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you'd answer that. How many of you answered your soul right there? Okay. And he said, not, not your soul. What's something else besides your soul that you can take to heaven? And I looked at him, I'm like, nothing. He said, wrong. There's only one thing besides your soul you can take with you to heaven. You wanna know what it is? Yeah. He looked at me, he said, people. I wanna to talk to you today because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, ah, they're few. We do not have a harvest problem. We have a laborer problem. What that means is that there are people in your world that would know Jesus, that could know Jesus, if you would actually help them know Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. Grab your notes and I want you to write down the answer to the question I'm about to give you. Who in your world doesn't know Jesus? Who at your job doesn't know Jesus? Who in your family doesn't know Jesus? Let me help you. Who at your job in the desk next to you smelling like some fried food doesn't know Jesus? Who's the mom sitting in a lounge chair at the ball field at your kid's sporting event that doesn't know Jesus? Who's the person you sit on an inner tube with in the cove on Old Hickory Lake that doesn't know Jesus? Here, here's what I'm asking. Who's your five? Who is your five? I, I want you to take some time right now to write down the names of people who you know that doesn't know the Jesus that you say you follow. Because Jesus says that the harvest ah, is plentiful. That's not the problem. The problem isn't there, there's not enough people to work it. What is he saying? He, he's saying that there are people there's a lot of people who will listen to the gospel, but we don't have a lot of people who will actually tell them the gospel. That there are people all around you in your world, in your life that doesn't know Jesus. And so how long will we hesitate? How long are we gonna sit in a chair? How long are we gonna sit on the bleachers? How long are we gonna sit in a cove or sit in a cubicle where there's people in your life that doesn't know Jesus? I don't know about you, but to hell with hesitation. I'm trying to tell somebody about the God who loves me. Yeah. <laughs> now, some of you, I love saying to hell with hesitation. Won't you say that with me? Say to hell with hesitation. Now somebody's offended right there because it's like, I can't believe this man talks like this. See, I love talking like that because I know it, it offends some people, but here's what I've learned. If, if you're offended about the pastor saying hell in church, if you're more offended about me saying hell, then you are worried about the friends you know that are going to hell, there's a problem. So today I just came to awaken the church. If you're not a believer, lean in because you're about to get a secret of what this church is all about. But if you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, I came to wake up something God put inside of you. I came to call you to the place where you're living out a purpose that's greater than you. I'm, I'm calling you to share your faith and here's why. Because your faith may be personal, but your faith is not private. And if your faith stays private, your faith will eventually become pointless. God has positioned you in your world on purpose. 
And I just think that it's time for the church to stop acting like a minimum wage worker doing what they gotta do to get by and start acting like an owner of the faith and actually share our faith with the people we claim we love. It's time for some of us to stop just showing up on a Sunday and trying to get to heaven one day. God didn't save you just so you can get to heaven one day. God saved you so you can bring heaven to earth now. Yeah. To hell with hesitation. We, we, got a, we got a job to do. How long will we hesitate? Nobody else is coming. What if the only way they'll actually spend eternity with God is through you? See, we don't have a harvest problem. We got a hesitation problem. We don't have a brokenness problem. There's enough brokenness in the world. We got a boldness problem. We have Christians like you and like I that tend to hesitate for all different kinds of reasons. We hesitate because, well, maybe we don't know a whole lot. Maybe we're insecure in such a way where if people ask us a question that we don't know the answer for, it's intimidating. And so we would rather stay quiet and share an Instagram reel or share an inspiring quote on Facebook than to actually talk to them about Jesus. What's interesting is that there was a study done that says that 84% of people would come to church that don't go to church if you would just ask them. There's another study that's done that 70% of Americans will never get a personal invitation to come to church. I don't know about you, but that's a problem with me. That 70% of Americans in this country will never get invited to church. That's why Paul asked this question in Romans 10. He says, how can they call on him to save unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And if, how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Somebody say, tell them. Yeah. Come on, find the neighbor, say, tell them. Yeah. How can the people in your world hear about God if you refuse to tell them? So I'm not asking you today to be a preacher. We, we, we fear being that that weird and pushy Christian. Does anybody know a weird and pushy Christian? Go ahead and lift your hand. Keep them up real quick. If you know a weird and, you know what I'm talking about. If you know a weird and pushy Christian, keep your hands up high, everybody in the room. If you know somebody now, look around and if they got their hand down, they might be a weird and pushy <laughs> Christian. Why we, we hesitate to talk about God. I'm not talking about being weird. I'm not talking about standing downtown with a picket fence because Lord knows that's effective. I'm talking about having a relationship with people that you love. How long are you going to say you love them, but love them not enough for your comfort? When's going to be the time that the church says, I love you more than I love my preference. I love you more than your opinion of me. If God set you free and God saved you, and you got the keys, why would you let somebody run their life off a cliff into hell? See, Jesus, he, he saw the crowds and it says he had compassion on them. That idea of compassion means he was moved in the gut. There, there was something when he looked at a crowd of people that broke his heart because they were harassed and they were helpless. And they, he says, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd are led to the slaughter. Sheep without a shepherd are not protected. Sheep without a shepherd will lose their life. And Jesus looks at the crowd and he says, I'm, I'm moved to do something. But what I love about Jesus, he doesn't just look at a crowd, but he sees people. He sees an individual. He has compassion for people like you and like me. It reminds me of this uh, moment in John chapter four. If you got a Bible, you can follow along. I'm gonna kind of paraphrase. We'll read a couple, couple verses in it, but Jesus was on his way to Galilee and he was leaving Judea. And as he was on his way, there was a town in between Judea and Galilee known as Samaria and now what you need to understand about Samaria is that most of the time, if not all of the time, when Jews would travel, 
because they didn't associate with Samaritans, because they were those people, they would intentionally go around Samaria just to avoid any and all contact. In fact, so much so that they actually believed that if our shadows even touched, I that am righteous and clean would be made unrighteous and dirty because of you, a Samaritan. See, Jews had nothing to do with those people, but John chapter 4, 4 says that Jesus, he had to go through Samaria. Come on, say had to. He had to. Now, he didn't have to because that was the only route. There was another route. But Jesus wasn't interested in taking the route the world took. Jesus was interested in those people. Jesus understood that if I'm going to change the world, the world needs a relationship with their father, God. And so it says he had to go through Samaria, through Samaria, through some area. You're going to have to go through some area you don't like. You're going to have to go through some area to make a difference. There is some area you're avoiding, some people, those people, messed up people, jacked up people, broken people, the people that you think don't look like you. It's just because you haven't looked in the mirror lately. Those people, you're going to have to go through Samaria to do the thing God has called you to do. There's the ring from heaven right there. (laughs) Jesus had to go through Samaria. And when he gets there, it says he was tired from the long journey. (laughs) Isn't it good news that Jesus got tired too? Any tired people in the house? Come on, somebody. Find a neighbor, say, wake up. (laughs) To hell with hesitation. He was tired. So he sat down at this well. It was about noon and um, he was thirsty. Any thirsty people in the house? Oh, y'all don't want to talk about thirsty people. Speaking of thirsty people, as Jesus was sitting down at this well, this woman came up. And and typically, people didn't come to the well at that time because it was too hot. It was the middle of the day. They used to come in the morning. That's when everybody would go, and that's when they would get their water. But this woman, for some reason, waited till it was clear, the coast was clear, to actually go and get the thing that she needed, which was water, because this woman was thirsty. Somebody say thirsty. thirsty. Say thirsty. Yes, millennial, I'm talking about the thirsty you're thinking of right now. I'm thinking about... Thirsty. Does anybody know any thirsty people? Any thirsty people? Yes, I'm talking about that kind of thirsty. Anybody so bold to say I'm sitting next to a thirsty person? I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Everybody that's older than I'm really like thirsty. I mean, I could use some water. No, 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 no. It's not. <laughs> she wanted water, but she also was thirsty. Aren't you glad that Jesus talks to thirsty people? I just wonder if sometimes we miss Jesus because we want to associate with thirsty people. And the reason we never hear from God is because that's where God is. He was sitting at a well talking to a thirsty woman, and he said, I'm thirsty. Could you give me something to drink? She's like, well, wait a second. How could you, a Jew, talk to a thirsty Samaritan woman like me? And and Jesus answered her. He said, woman, if you you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you got nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from him himself as did as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everybody who drinks the water, this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me some of that water. I don't want to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. I wonder how many times we're going to keep going to dry wells looking to get satisfied. He says, the water you're looking for, it's not going to be found there. In fact, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, yep, that's true. You've had five husbands. And the husband you got now, I mean, the man you're with now, you're sleeping with him but he's not your husband because she was thirsty. And she says, sir, you, you're right. I am, I'm, I'm thirsty. But then she says this, the woman said, I, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned 
and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Why? Because Jews didn't talk to Samaritans because men didn't talk to women, but no one dared ask him, what do you want and why you're talking with her? They hesitated a little bit. Like they didn't know what was going on because see earlier in John chapter four, when they got to the well, the disciples got hungry. So they left Jesus by himself to have a conversation with a thirsty woman. And here they come back and they're real confused because they're like, wait a second, why is he talking to her? I don't get it. Maybe they didn't get it because sometimes disciples can be so concerned with what they consume rather than what they can contribute. They, they didn't get it because they had went out and they were looking for food. And so here they are standing and it says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. <laughs> you ever said something really dumb to God before? <laughs> Jesus over here trying to talk to this woman. You're worried about what he's gonna eat. They're like, Rabbi, eat, eat something. He said, listen, I got food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, look how dumb this is. Could someone have brought him food? <laughs> Somebody said they missed it. They missed it. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Come on, look around and say, open your eyes. Find somebody else, say, open your eyes. He said, what, what are you even talking about? Yeah, the food I got, I'm not here to just consume. I'm here to contribute. Don't you, by the way, have a saying that there's four months till harvest, but I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's, because of the thirsty woman's. He told me everything I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. Don't you love that Jesus is interruptible? There's something that is moved in the heart of God. When Jesus was on his way to Galilee, he stopped in Samaria just to get him a drink of some water. But because this woman said to hell with hesitation, I'm going back and talking to the people in my town, I'm bringing them to Jesus. It says that they all believed because of her testimony. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's, because of the woman's testimony. Because she was given something in that moment. She learned something in that moment. She met someone in that moment where she could not help. She could not hesitate. And then it says, and because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said, but now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. You me tell you why I love that? Because Jesus is in the business of using thirsty people to change the world. Jesus chose to use the most unlikely person because that's what God does. He often chooses the unlikely to do the extraordinary. And there's some of you today that feel unqualified. You don't feel educated enough. You don't have all the right answers, but thank God that he doesn't use the educated. He doesn't just use the people who have all the right answers. He uses thirsty people like you and like me for the kingdom. And I promise you this, this week, if you will open your eyes, say open your eyes and look around, say look around. There are people who are willing to listen. The question is, will you be someone willing to talk? I'm telling you this week, if you'll pay attention, there are people at your work that are waiting for you to talk to them about Jesus. There are people in your family that are without hope and without purpose that are waiting for you to talk to them about Jesus. Jesus said, look around, the harvest is ripe. It's this picture I get in my mind 
of a cornfield. Anybody just loves some good corn? Come in below some grilled corn. Husk and all, peel it back, it's all hot. Throw some butter on there, throw some tahine. Come on, somebody. If you haven't had tahine on some corn, you need to get you some tahine on some corn. And uh, I get this picture in my head of all this harvest. Have y'all ever seen a cornfield that just looks great? Has anybody been so bold to get out the car and steal a couple husk? Anybody? <laughs> just me? Okay, okay. He's saying the harvest is ripe. It's ready to be picked. But let me tell you what will happen if you don't pick a harvest when it's ripe, the harvest will perish. That there are people in your life that are, that are ready for you to pick them or talk to them or choose to share your faith with that will listen to you if you will open your eyes. Who do you know that doesn't know Jesus? Who, who is you're five. You gotta tell them, say tell them. Come on, punch your neighbor, say tell them. You gotta tell them, number one, about who Jesus is. You have to tell them about who Jesus is. Because in a world that says all roads lead to heaven, wrong. In a culture that thinks about, that thinks about it, in such a way where you just gotta be more good than bad, wrong. To a generation that is starving for truth, but is fed lies. You gotta tell somebody who Jesus is, that he is the way, that he is the truth, and that, is he, that he is the life, and there is no other way to the Father except by him. Can I get an amen, somebody? You gotta tell them, say tell them. You gotta tell them who is he, but who, who, who is he? Who is he? I'm so glad you asked. Because Jesus is the bread of life for the hungry. He is the light of the world for those living in darkness. He is the door for the outcast. That he is the good shepherd for those who are lost and hurting and need guidance and protection. He is the resurrection and the life for those who are dead and without hope. He is the vine for those who are thirsty. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. Can I get an amen from somebody that believes it? To hell with hesitation. Let's quit watering down the gospel and let's tell people who Jesus is. He is the one who saw you. He is the one who cares about you. He is the one who knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows your name. He knows what you've went through. He knows what you're dealing with. And he knows every time you failed him. But thank God he didn't hesitate to fail you. He didn't fail you. Now, what did he do? He, he didn't hesitate. He came from heaven. It's time that, that you, that I, that we together start telling people about who Jesus is. No one else is coming. Repent and believe the gospel. The time has come, the kingdom is near. And you can either tell them or you can hesitate. I say to hell with hesitation. Let's talk to him about who Jesus is. Come on, let's give him praise right there for about five seconds. Number two, you gotta tell him what he's done. You tell him about who he is. She said, this is the man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? She said, this is who he is, but we gotta learn to tell him what he's done for us. He's the one who knows me. He's the one who made me. He is all knowing. He is the one who speaks with truth. He is the one that is gracious. He is the one who chose to talk to me. He is the one who sat by me when I was thirsty at a well. He's the one who told me everything I have ever done. He is the one who loved me where I was and forgave me for my sin. Come on, what, what's your testimony? I don't even have to know all the specifics. Here's what I can tell you. You were hopeless, but God. You are helpless, but God. You are addicted, but God. You are dead, but God loved you so much because of his great mercy and because he cares about you. He sent his one and only son to die for you and resurrect from the grave so that you can be forgiven and set free. I was blind, but God made it possible for me to see. That's the testimony of you. And you don't have to have some crazy story to be effective. It's time that your world knows your testimony. You gotta tell them 
your testimony. You, you got to tell them about what Jesus did for you and how I was crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And if I'm gonna go on living, living in the flesh, I'm gonna live by the spirit of God that loved me and gave Himself up for me. He is the God who took my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh and put a new spirit inside of me. So now the spirit I have is not one of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind and who the sun sets free is free indeed. You may, may not be where you wanna be, but thank God you're not where you used to be because he is gracious and he is loving and he cares about you and he saved you from the pit of hell. You gotta tell him what he did. You gotta tell your testimony. Say testimony. So here's mine. I grew up in a divorced home. Parents who cared about me. Went to two different types of church. Didn't like any of them. Didn't wanna go. Believed in God. Got baptized as a 10 year old because I thought that's what you were supposed to do because the preacher was scaring the hell out of me. By the way, I didn't come to scare the hell out of you today. I came to get heaven to you. And so I had no idea what it meant. I thought I was good. Felt like at that point I could live however I wanted to live. And so I get into high school and my whole life, my whole identity was defined by being an athlete. To be the best athlete in my school, best athlete in my county. I was known by a lot of people. It's where I found my significance. It's where I found my purpose. But then I lost a little brother and a grandmother who helped raise me. And my whole world changed. I never stopped believing there was a God. I just didn't like him. Because I couldn't wrap my brain around why that would happen. And so what did I do? I, I coped with my pain through partying. I coped with my, my pain through just giving my entire life to a football field, a basketball court, or a baseball diamond. I spent every Friday night sneaking out, lying to my parents about where I was at so I could go and get drunk out of my mind, passed out on somebody's floor and wondering how many girls I could sleep with. And I found myself, though I looked real nice on the outside, I had a smile on, there was something inside of me that was depressed. Now, we didn't use those words back when I was in high school. We didn't use those words in 2011 and 2012. I had no idea what was really going on, but there was something inside of me that did not have hope. And I felt like the only way I might maybe, just maybe find it again is if I ran away and fleed. So I did what a lot of you may have done. And it might be the very reason you're in Gallatin right now. I thought I could just run away from my past and form a new identity with new people. And so I fleed as far as away as I could to the University of Memphis and I found myself there in the dorm, depressed, alone, having no idea why I was on earth. I was just looking for the next party to go to, looking for a fraternity to hang with, had no friends, brand new place. I remember sitting in my dorm room on the third day, trying to medicate and escape pain and escape my reality. So I just, I played about eight hours of NCAA football. Come on, somebody. You can clap for that part. Don't clap for the next one. When that wasn't enough, I just started watching porn. When that wasn't enough, I felt like I was at the end of my rope. And so for the first time in my life, I picked up a Bible. And at that exact moment, a new roommate who I'd never met before walked into the room and saw this guy holding a Bible. What he didn't know at the time was that I'd never read it, but he didn't hesitate. He pulled up a chair and asked me, you a Christian? And I looked back at him and I said, bro, I have no idea. He said, were you reading the Bible? You believe that stuff? I said, I don't know what I believe. He said, let me tell you about who God is. And let me tell you about what he's done in my own life. And maybe just maybe you can resonate with that. I'm so thankful that God took a senior guy who was making a lot of money, didn't even need a degree. I'm so grateful he took a senior guy to move into the freshman dorm like some weirdo. Because that man saw that South Hall at the University of Memphis 
He saw a harvest that was plentiful, but the laborers were few. And I'm so glad in that moment that that man didn't hesitate. And he said, let me tell you the gospel. You're saved by grace through faith, not of your righteous works so that no one can boast. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. And if you will repent and believe the gospel, you can be saved. And in that moment, I thought, to hell with hesitation. I'm giving my life to God. I'm so thankful that I had a friend who didn't hesitate to share the gospel with me. Because then, when God changed my world, He started changing the world around me. And all of a sudden, my eyes were opened. And I too saw the dorms as a place where there was a lot of people who didn't know God. And I saw my fraternity as an opportunity to share my faith. And I looked at the basketball team and I looked at my family and I looked back home at my city and I thought, when the time comes and I graduate, I'm going back home, I'm gonna move to Gallatin and because there's a harvest that's plentiful but the laborers are few, to hell with hesitation. I gotta tell people about who God is and what God's done for me and what God wants to do for them. You have no idea what one moment of boldness can do for the rest of eternity. You have no, mo no idea who needs to hear your testimony. In fact, I believe right now there are people who just heard mine and I just read your mail because God is trying to do something in you. And if you feel a pressing right now on your chest, that's the Holy Spirit trying to get you to repent from your sin and believe the good news of the gospel. Amen. You can't earn your way. You can't pray to Mary enough. You can't just be a good person. You can't tithe your way. Only one way to get to heaven, and that's through the name of Jesus, Amen. by having a relationship with him. So you gotta tell them not just who he is, about what he's done for you, but finally, you gotta tell them what he can do for them. Because it's not good news for them until you share the good news to them. And Jesus didn't die for you and give his life for you so that you could sit in a seat waiting to get to heaven. He died for you so that you could help bring heaven to earth. He wants to use you to change your world. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. What happens if you don't? What happens if you don't tell them? I know I'm a pastor with a lot of just passion and energy up here. and I'm gonna tell you what will happen. Go study the book of Joshua and Judges and here's what you'll find you'll find that when God rescued his people from the hand of the Egyptians, he made a way where there was no way and he pulled them out of slavery like he's done for many of you. And he made a way through the river and as they were going through the river, as it dried up, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take 12 stones and when you get to the other side, I want you to build me an altar there to remember what God has done for you. And when the next generation comes and you go on a little family vacation, I want you to show them that, that those 12 stones. I want you to show them how you used to be in slavery, but then you got set free. How there was no way, but God made a way. How, how I was dead in my sin, but God made me alive in Christ. And he took me from here and he placed me on solid ground. I want you to tell them what I've done for you. But here was the problem. If you go from Joshua 4 and you keep on reading to Judges 2, there's a problem and here it is. Verse 10. After that generation died, the one God delivered, another generation grew up who did not know the Lord, nor what he had done for them. Why didn't they know him? Because the laborers were few. They stopped telling the story. Parent, look at me. Your kid know your testimony? I'm not talking about how many people you slept with and all their names. I'm not talking about all the drugs you did. But did they know that God saved you? Did they know that you grew up in church just like you're trying to raise your kids in church and your parents were believers and you too got a high at Christian camp and you said that prayer that meant nothing to you but all your friends were doing it and you thought by being a good person and trying to do all the good things and go to church, you were saved but what you didn't realize, what you didn't know, did they know about the fact that religion will keep people in bondage and send them to hell but a relationship with God will give them everlasting life? Did they know that testimony? Because your power, you have there's power in your testimony. 
God saved you, sets you free. To hell with hesitation. We're not gonna let a generation grow up and not know God and what he's done. Look at me, parents. If you make coming to church optional, your kids will make God unnecessary. Parents, God called you to be their parent, not their friend. I don't care if your kid doesn't wanna to come to church. They need the truth of God's word spoken over their life and they need some people to do it with. Can I get an amen from somebody? To hell with hesitation, let's make sure this next generation knows God. Why don't you stand up to your feet? I wanna, I wanna close. You have to tell them the gospel. What is the gospel? Let me make it clear. The gospel is not become a good person. The gospel is not saying a little prayer and everything gets better. The gospel is not that Jesus came to make bad people good. The gospel is that Jesus came to make dead people alive. Yes. The, the gospel is that God so loved the world that he gave his only, only son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through his son, Jesus. And if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What this next generation needs, what your family needs, what your world needs is the gospel of Jesus. And so will you tell them? That's my question. Whose world will be changed because of you? Who's gonna be in heaven because of you? Who's gonna find freedom because of you? Who's gonna be in church next week because of you? It's time for the church to stop sitting to the sideline and falling more and more in love with consumption and convenience than we, than we do with the world who doesn't know Christ. Whose world's gonna be changed? Because of you. Jesus says, so therefore pray and ask the Lord to send out more workers in the harvest field. So that's my prayer. My, my job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Paul tells, it, tells him in Ephesians, your job is to do the ministry Every member is a minister. Everybody has a story. When I left that old man standing there and he said, the only thing you can bring from this earth is people. He looked at me and he said, so don't hesitate, give them heaven, son. hell with hesitation. Let's give people heaven. Amen. Come on, if you believe it, why don't you just praise God right now and thank him for saving you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray two prayers. And the first one is for the people who are laborers. It's time for you to stop being a minimum wage worker and just doing what you gotta do to get to heaven. It's time for you to act like an owner of the faith and change your world. So I'm gonna pray for you. And here's a prayer I prayed all week. We had two baptisms last service. And I just had this crazy thought, what if, what if I never baptized another person in this church? Because every single person that got baptized moving forward, you did it, not me. <laughs> what if every single person who went public with their faith wasn't from an Instagram reel? What if this church wasn't built on a pastor? What if this church wasn't built on an online following? What if this church was just built with some laborers that saw a need and opened their eyes and did something about it? Let's make a difference. Let's give them heaven. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask right now the Holy Spirit would come and fill people up, that they would, that they would understand that you removed that old dead heart of stone, you put something new in them. I pray that when they see the crowds, they have compassion on them because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I pray that as they leave here, they would go and proclaim the good news of the kingdom to repent from our sin and to believe the gospel of Jesus. I pray that the world will come to know you through these people right here, right now. Thank you for using the unlikely to do the extraordinary. We say yes to you right now. And so today, church,
church, if that's you and you're saying yes to the calling of God to go into the world and make disciples and teaching them to obey everything he's commanded and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, on the count of three, every head bowed, eyes still closed, I want you to lift your hand and say, today I accept that calling. I'm done sitting on the sidelines to hell with hesitation. I want people to know the God who loved me, people to know the God who saved me. I want people to know the freedom they can have in Christ. If that's you and you accept that call today on the count of three, one, lift your hand, two, three. If that's you, God, I thank you for the people committing to labor right now into your harvest. Do a great work in them and through them. Amen. Now I wanna pray for those of you who don't know God and you came in believing the same lie I believed. Today is the day of salvation. The kingdom is near. Repent from your sin, turn from your sin and believe the gospel of Jesus. He is the way, the truth and the life. He takes you from being dead and makes you alive. If that's your prayer today, right now, I just, I'm gonna pray and I want you to lift your hand, not the prayer that saves you, Jesus saves you. It's just a way to confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. So God, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now who are walk, walking in and stepping into the family of God today, who are gonna give their life to you, who are gonna believe that you are enough for them, that you died, that you rose from the grave so they can be forgiven. If that's you and today you're saying yes to making Jesus your Lord and your Savior, on the count of three, just shoot your hand up. Just gonna make eye contact with you. One, God loves you. Two, you don't have to stay the same. Three, just shoot your hand up and say, today I'm making that declaration. I'm giving my life to Jesus. He sees you. He sees you. Holy Spirit, come and fill those two women over there. Fill that man in the back row. God, I thank you today for saving. You're so good and so gracious. We love you. And if you prayed that today, I want you to all say this out loud. Say today, I give you my life. I believe she died for me. She rose from the grave, said I can be forgiven and set free. I surrender my life to you. God, I thank you for everyone who prayed that for the first time today. We love you and it's in Jesus name. Everybody said, come on, everybody said, come on, let's celebrate with heaven right now for those who gave their life to Christ today. Come on, let's give a little bit of praise to God for everybody who said, I'm done. I'm done hesitating to hell with hesitation. I got a job to do. Amen. Amen.